The Old Testament reading from the pro- book of the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the 20th chapter, also serving as the basis of our sermon. And here's uh, Jeremiah's plaint and his cry. O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. Well, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shot up in my bones, and I'm weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. Say all my close friends watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else would do. I love to tell the story. I'll sing this theme in glory and tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story how pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell a story for some have never heard message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story. I'll sing this theme in glory and tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. to tell the story for those who do it best. Seems hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, I'll sing the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. I'll sing this theme in glory 
to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And certainly Jeremiah had that big uh, opportunity and commission to tell a story, not so much at his time in his place of, of Jesus and his love, but of, of God's word to the people, the obstinate people of Israel, and, and he suffered derision and all kinds of trouble. So it's a challenge for him then, and it's a challenge for us here and now for sure. And yet, by his grace, we celebrate that story of God's love for us in Christ Jesus, no matter what, even though it might mean that we suffer all kinds of uh, trauma and trouble from the devil and the world and our sinful flesh. Our text for, for our sermon this morning from Jeremiah, but also touching on some of the other scripture verses. And here uh, he's, uh, he's accusing God. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You're stronger than me and have prevailed. So not only God, but also other people who say, denounce him, let's denounce him, say, my close friends, so thinking family even, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. And then, of course, the truth of the whole matter is that the Lord is the one who's in control. O Lord of hosts who test the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance. For the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. So far, the text. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, your temple, here together with the family of God, other brothers and sisters, family and friends. Bless the words, your word to us, and point us always to Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And point us always to you, for the world would want us to say so many other things and cause us to despair. But Lord, give us courage and hope, not only today, but every day, to see that you have the answer and that it is about your love for us, of Jesus and his love for us and the whole world. And so, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So grace, mercy, and peace be unto us all, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Have you ever felt like throwing up your hands and just saying, forget it, it's not worth it, it's too hard? It's taking too long, or that person's taking too long, or it's too much trouble, or I can't figure it out. Well, or we can say he, as in maybe a spouse, he's too stubborn, stuck in his ways, or can say she, she'll never change, and just say, I'm done, no more, that's it, I'm out of here. That's very much the lament, the cry of Jeremiah this morning in our text. God sent him as a spokesman, as a prophet, a person foretelling what's going to go on if they didn't repent, if they weren't sorry, if they didn't listen to where God would have them be. But the thing is with Jeremiah, they, the people around him weren't listening and so Jeremiah warns them of God's coming judgment and destruction and calls them to change their ways, to turn around. In other words, to repent before it's too late. But all they do is deride him. They mock him, make fun of him. And they're after him. They're after his backside, his hide too, trying to deceive him, to try to pull him away, waiting for him actually to fall so that they can overcome him and take revenge of him, not only by their words, but by pounding on him. For how dare he call us to repentance? How dare he call us wrong? How dare he, like who is he, who's Jeremiah, to warn us about anything? 
because we're God's chosen people. We're Israel, right? And so Jeremiah's done. Or at least he wants to be at least saying it's not worth it. Not worth it at all. This being a prophet, being a preacher, being a pastor, as it were, it's not what I want to be, and it's not working at all. And so for certain, fast forward ahead, in Jesus' day, his disciples had days exactly like that. Jesus tells them in the Holy Gospel that Chris read to us this morning, basically what happened to Jeremiah is going to happen to you, and you're going to get it from your family members, from your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sisters even. And it's the people of God in Grace Lutheran Congregation or, or God is able family. That's horrible, isn't it? And so what are we to do? Well... It's short and simple as we continue to proclaim the word in season and out. Because it's God speaking to us still through ordinary people, through the Bible. And so as God's people, we will be hated, certainly by the world. We will be persecuted, even by family members. Some people will call us, we have a mental illness and we should be taking extra medication. Or that we have demons. And sometimes we need to take medicine, right? Yeah. And we need talk, good thought, talk therapy. And we need healing ministry and prayer for sure because God answers our prayers in Jesus' name. And yet being in God's people and doing God's work is not easy at all. Speaking and doing God's will or his word, it's not easy. Sin doesn't like to be uncovered. Sin doesn't like to be corrected. It wants to be left alone and hidden and to reign in darkness. And so expose it. Poke it. Speak to it. You're going to feel its wrath. It's like poke a skunk that's alive, right? You're going to get a great big pour on you. Certainly the disciples had their Jeremiah moments. This is the thanks we get for giving up everything, our jobs, our pensions, for walking away from our businesses and families and homes and going out, following Jesus and being with him, helping people. The disciples would have had the same answer. Fine, I'm done. You couldn't blame them if they thought this being a disciple, forget it. I'm just going to go home, kick back, have a beer. Do you ever feel that way as a parent, as a child, as a spouse, as a grandparent, as a Christian, as a Christian husband or a Christian wife? When things aren't going the way that you would like to, even as a Christian, Bible-believing Christian, or maybe you've been on the other side of that and been the one causing someone else to throw up their hands in despair and just wanting to give up because of your sin, my sin, stubbornness, pride. Well, maybe, right? The thing is, we have, if not to others in the world, then certainly we've acted this way towards God not only by continuing in our sin or saying, oh, it's okay, but continuing to sin and think nothing of it. I'm not hurting anyone. I had a talk yesterday with another pastor at the wedding, at a, the wedding that I did reception and things, everything, he built house, just beautiful house for his family. And he's been married, what, 42 years. And uh, things weren't going well. And yeah, tried to live the Christian life and build a Christian home. And being a pastor, in this case, he was a pastor in the Baptist church. Bible-believing Christian for sure. And it just seemed like more and more was coming upon him. He couldn't cope. And he wanted to commit suicide even. But he's still, by God's grace, carrying on because of God's word continued to dwell in him. 
and even without his wife of 42 years, by himself. And he's the one that reminded me yesterday too that like Moses, his wife wasn't with him. He was recipient of broken marriage and he carried on. And so in brokenness, we too as God's people carry on, hopefully clinging to God's word. That old, old story that we could give it, which is fresh and new really every day of Jesus and his love. And continue not only by being in the word, but by living the word. And that's why Paul, in his letter to the Romans this morning, he asked them, are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? Well, the fact is we do sin all the time in thought, word, and deed. What Paul is describing here is the attitude, which is so common that I can sin because I know Jesus forgives me. Or I love to sin and Jesus loves to forgive. What a system. So I know I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't say this, but I really want to. So whatever, God will forgive me. Paul calls that being a slave to sin. Slave to sin. The world calls it freedom, doing whatever I want, when I want, and how I want. The world calls it freedom, being able to do whatever, following your lusts, your urges, whatever it may be, letting the world be our thermometer, barometer for living. And yet as God's people, we say, what does God's word say? How is God speaking to this situation? The world would say, well, it must be good because freedom is good. That's good. The world, though, fact is, gets it wrong because it's not freedom when we're being controlled by addictions. This past week, I was in Grand Prairie, actually Beaver Lodge for a beekeeping uh, field day. And uh, Tessa, a dear friend of the Edmonton Beekeeping Association, stopped for gas. There's a fellow who was looking just in walking around, knew that he was on some kind of a uh, marijuana trip or cocaine trip. Horrible. Probably 24 years old and being led by that addiction. And so being controlled by our lusts, our urges, even our temper, our pride, that's not God's way. It's not freedom. It's being a slave to whatever it is, whether it's pornography or marijuana, cocaine. Our urges, and it brings about despair. It's slavery that we can continue in its grip and control and not see its danger. How horrible. To which Paul adds, what good is that doing? What are you getting out of doing those things that lead only to death and uselessness, right? Try to get a job when you're under those kinds of circumstances. I'm talking being on skid row because you can't wait for your next hit. So given the long history and rebellion and stubbornness of God's people, beginning with Adam and Eve down to you and me today, we could hardly blame God if he just threw up his hands and gave up on us. God could say, that's the way you want to be? Fine. I'm done. And he did that a couple of times. Take the flood. Nobody survived it, but Noah and his family. And so it is. The Old Testament, the Genesis account, there's crime, punishment, mercy. That's a theme. And who committed the crime? It's God's people. Punishment. God punishes sin, just like a good parent. Ought to punish gently or discipline the child. And then mercy. It's God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. So God could have given up on us, on, the, on all creation, totally, but he didn't. He didn't leave us to our slavery to sin. Instead, he threw up his hands on the cross 
Jesus died on the cross for our sins. It's as simple as that. We're as complex as that. When God's doing happen in that way, he said, you're worth it. Like the gospel it was read. We're worth way more than many sparrows. And sparrows and, way, and pennies are worth lots. We're worth it. Not so that we can continue to sin, continue to be slaves of sin as much as we want, only now not have anything to worry about, but set free from slavery, set free for something way, way better. Yeah, and even if we're on our deathbeds, that we can lift up prayers to God, not only for ourselves, but for others. That we not continue down the road blaming God or in having bitterness and division that leads to death and hell, but, but share the blessings of the Lord with others, even with those that mock us, with our enemy, as it were. Walk on the road of faith, Christian faith and love that leads to eternal life. And for a lot of people, that's just a pie-in-the-sky idea. It's like, well, it's not here now. I don't experience it. And yet we get a foretaste of it, whether we're in God's Word, around the Bible studies that we have, in worship. It might be very structured in our Lutheran settings, but that's so that there's familiarity. And we still go in our worship service, the life of Christ as it were. We come knowing that we're sinful, confess our sins, receive God's forgiveness, sing and celebrate, celebrate the Lord's Supper where God says, do this. As often as you do this, you remember my death till I come. And so it is that God wants us to have the good life. And Jesus, he's the one who frees us from our sins. He became a slave for us. He took our sins upon himself and buried them at the foot of the cross. Jesus, born as we were, he wasn't born in slavery to sin as we are, but freely put himself there for you and me and the whole world. He lived a perfect life. He died a death that we should have died and set us free from sin to get rid of that which would enslave us, to free us from our sins, to be, as Paul says in our epistle, to be slaves or dolos, slaves, people who do things that are good, slaves of righteousness is the way the Greek translates. People who want to do right, not out of sin, but be of good, not of evil, thinking, well, what can I get out of it, quid pro quo, but serving God in holiness and righteousness every day of our lives. And now we might be thinking, well, slavery is slavery, and I don't want to be a slave of anyone or anything. I want to be free. But can we see our desire to be free, to be our own master or mistress? It's a form of slavery to self. It's a form of idolatry, idolizing myself, above God, idolizing my spouse or someone else above God. It's not really a question either of being free or a slave. It's a false distinction and understanding, really. It's being in Christ. What matters is that who do we serve? Who do we follow? It's like Pat's uh, the thought for the day. By God's grace and the Holy Spirit's indwelling, we want to follow Jesus, hopefully. The world doesn't want us to do that. Follow me, follow this, follow the next fad. What is the next fad? Well, it's still being made up. Well, spiritually, and Holy Spirit speaking through the word, the question really is not whether or not we will have a master, but it's who. Who is your master? Who is my master? Who is your Lord? Is it sin or is it God? And we can't blame God for sin. Some people, and in fact, many people say, well, if God wouldn't have put the serpent there, nothing would have happened. No, 
Choose you this day whom you will serve. God doesn't want us to be robots. And he never created anybody to be robots. Gives us choices. Choose Jesus. Choose the way of the world. Is it really boiling it down? Is it, am I serving sin? Or am I serving the Lord? Am I serving because I have to? Or because it's a privilege? And it gives me great joy. And I don't know what today will hold or tomorrow, but God knows what today is going to be about. I might have made plans, and I did, and by God's grace, I'm here. And what an undeserved privilege it is for me to be here, really. And yet, I pray that God will give me joy and give us joy of being together. Is the taskmaster that we're following leading you to death, or is it our Savior, Jesus, leading you and me to life? It's a holy baptism. It's God's means of grace, like his word and holy Sa the Holy Supper. Holy baptism is where we're given a new master. Holy baptism is where this divine re-yoking and renunciation of the devil takes place in big lights. And we can use a font or we can have holy baptism in a river or in the ocean. But it's water cleansing, renewal, and water connected with God's word. Holy baptism is so important. The words that we heard from St. Paul are from a kind of baptism chapter, chapter 6, so we need to hear and take them to light. And so what he says here happens in baptism, that when we're baptized, Jesus throws off the yoke of sin, in effect, that we're not strong enough to throw off and re-yokes us or puts on his blessings of light and life. And to him, to Jesus, the yoke is easy. It's burden, it's light. Matthew 11, verse 30. So Jesus' yoke, Jesus' blessing, it's way better than anything the world could ever give us. A better master, a good shepherd who forgives our sins, binds up our wounds, doesn't let us bleed out, feeds us richly and abundantly, and who doesn't give up on you and me, even leaving the 99 sheep to go and find you or me who have gone astray not willing that anyone, not a single one, would perish, but that all would come to have life, life in Jesus' name. And that's why God sent Jeremiah to Judah, and to Israel too, but particularly to Judah. And that's why God sent his disciples out. And that's why he's still calling and sending pastors and evangelists and missionaries and nurses and teachers, deacons, deaconesses, as we heard in our Bible study this morning, to call you and me and all people to repent, to turn from our wicked ways, to confess that I've lived as if God didn't matter and as if I mattered most, that I have lived as a slave to sin, that I've followed my own urges and desires way too many times, to repent and receive his unburdening forgiveness and life. For as Paul so clearly put it, the wages of sin is death. The wages of living as our own master, the wages of our so-called freedom, is death. And yet the free gift of God to those who are yoked or connected or tied into him, who are baptized into Christ, is eternal life with Christ Jesus our Lord. And so live in Christ brothers and sisters in Christ and friends. That's who we are. And those people we are tempted to throw up our hands about and give up on, well, not so fast. Because our Lord is sending you and me to speak a good word, to give his freeing forgiveness and loving care to those all around us. And perhaps to someone no one else will. In the Bible study this morning, a, a good question was asked of, like, what about pe if people uh, uh, think badly about us or so? And so the answer that 
Jeremiah, hopefully, God through Jeremiah would say, or through the disciples would say, don't worry about the world, the devil, our sinful flesh would think. Don't use the ways of the world as your barometer or as taking the temperature from the world. Take your temperature and thoughts and marching orders from God's word. The world might even hate us and will ultimately. They might even kill us for the gospel. The disciples went down that path, and yet we have the hope beyond the grave. It can be a bit frightening to be servants for Jesus' sake, sharing God's word, sharing the gospel. We might have our head cut off. We might be taken advantage of. We will be mocked in multiple ways and ridiculed, perhaps even persecuted. Well, remember these words of Jesus. Have no fear of them. Don't be afraid. I see every sparrow that falls to the ground, and you're worth more than any of them. I know exactly how many hairs are on your head at any given moment. You don't even know that. And while this world can kill you, no one can take your eternal life. No one can take your life ultimately. That's mine. I have it. You're my baptized child. No one can change that. I have been redeemed. I'm a lamb of the king. And though there are many things hidden in this world and life, things that we cannot see and don't know, it will one day be made known. Jesus says, on the last day, in heaven certainly, all will be revealed. So while we may not know why things are happening the way they are, and things are tough and concerning and turn our stomachs, and maybe even seem to be turning out worse and worse and worse, and evil is winning, it's not so ultimately. The cross looked that way. But it was in reality the greatest good. For on the cross, Jesus was, to use the words of way back Jeremiah, is with us as a dreaded warrior, fighting this world's prince in a fight to the finish, and who was triumphant? Jesus. So fear not, for I am with you, says Jesus. His triumph is for you, for me, for the whole world. Things in this life aren't easy, but with Jesus, they are good and working good for you, for me, for Jesus has promised. And so Jeremiah, though starting out in lament and despair, he ends in joy, in singing as we sang the psalm in other ways. Sing praise to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Sing praise to the Lord. Glory in his holy name. For the victory is his even now. And it's ours being connected to Christ, even in the midst of troubles, in the midst of horrible diagnostics. For you too, you have been brought with the price of his own blood, Jesus' blood. And he is interceding before you and me, before the Father's throne in heaven. And that even while the trials and troubles still rage around us, even while burdens are heavy and sin seems so strong in our lives, in our children's lives, in our extended family's lives, even though we cannot see any victory now, it is yours in Christ. And we have other people that pray for us. Think of God as able congregation or family. They pray for us, I'm sure, right, Pastor? We pray for you. Yes. And the bus load going to Drumheller. What a wonderful blessing. If we're able to go, praise God for that. And if we're not able to go, praise God still. But try encourage one another and all the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. Even in the midst of troubles, we can share God's love. We can share the building that God has granted to us with others so that the gospel can go out in different ways. And it's to God's glory. We, we can glory in our shame, but we know that even in the shame, God is with us. God loves us with an everlasting love. And that nothing, neither sin nor death nor hell, 
They can't win the victory, for we are safe, safe in the everlasting arms of our Jesus, our Lord Jesus. So continue to sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord with Jeremiah and all the saints, with the disciples, all, that, all those that have gone before us. For he who has delivered the life of Jesus from the hand of evildoers, from death to life, delivers you and me too. And so the peace that passes understanding, guard and keep our hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus, both now and to life everlasting. Amen.